Kobe the hero has arrived. Honesty is his policy, and honesty, as it turns out, is absolutely devastating, both physically and emotionally. This is the Kobe I've been waiting for for so, so long. And to produce a bit of an honesty impact of my own, it is overdue. Overdue, but well worth the wait. The Marines now officially have themselves a mini GARP with the potential to evolve into a prime GARP, and perhaps to something even greater, a prime Kobe. Also, he has Conqueror's Haki, which is pretty. <laughs> because of all of the people who get to join this very exclusive club, I love that Kobe's membership was approved before Sanji's. In all seriousness though, Kobe deserves it. And every single beat of this chapter only reinforces that. Because 1088 presents the full journey of Kobe the hero. Starting with the color spread though, I don't often comment on these, but it's particularly appropriate because this spread features both Kobe and Garp in their pre-time skip era. And it's sort of like an East Blue version of the new age color spread that Oda did, which is one of my all time favorites. This was done for the Netflix live action, which I'm not going to opine on in this video, there are other videos for that, but Garp being such a large focus is interesting. And it might indicate that he has a much larger role in the live action series than he did in the manga. In fact, in the manga, Garp didn't even exist outside of the Diary of Kobe Meppo cover story. And speaking of, what is it? Almost literally 1000 chapters after that story, this flashback takes us right back into that cover story. It was like a double flashback. You get the story and then you also get struck in the Sabos by pure nostalgia. And this played out in very typical Oda style. He's very good at constructing flashbacks that use comedy to seed his dramatic payoffs. And this scene is pretty hilarious, posing the moral problem about what to do in the situation of a two person ship. And Garp is coldly stating that yes, you should leave the old man to die over the baby and the Marine. Isolated in this flashback, it's very calculated. As if Garp's mind operates purely on a series of equations designed to maximize future potential. And to be fair to Garp, even though it is a bit of a subversion of morals, he's not wrong. I feel like most people, if put in that position of the old man, would prefer to have the other two saved over themselves. But this lesson is more personal to Garp, because at this point in his life, he is the old man. This isn't an obscure hypothetical involving citizens. This is Garp actively preparing his young Marines for the reality that one day, they could be in a life or death situation where they need to leave him behind without a second thought in order to preserve the future. That is Garp's philosophy. Garp doesn't yet have an assigned justice like many of the other high-ranking Marines do, but with this in mind, I would say maybe future justice or even gradual justice, as in looking into the very long term, which can mean preserving the injustice of now in order to plant the seeds of change that will eventually grow in the future, which I imagine is very frustrating for those living in the present and would certainly cause quite a rift with a certain dragon who believes in the need for immediate change. But then we do a bit of flashback leapfrog, heading into the future, but something that is still the past to us. With a very interesting situation happening here, Blackbeard essentially has a form of diplomatic immunity, so he can do whatever he wants to the Marines because they don't have permission to fight him. Blackbeard could do literally anything. He could pull down his pants, turkey slap Vice Admiral Yamakaji in the face, and he'd still just have to do nothing but stands there like Yamakaji always does. Oda doesn't put Yamakaji in a scene unless there's nothing to be done. That was what was about to happen on Eckhead Island as well, by the way. Luffy also had this form of diplomatic immunity. It's just that Luchi didn't care and decided to go ahead and start a war. This flashback is juxtaposed directly against Garp's lesson because it's Kobe implementing that lesson. He is preserving the futures of 800 soldiers by giving up his own singular future, which is a pretty phenomenal deal if future is your currency of choice. Yamakaji lets him do this because Kobe is a sword member, which makes sense. One rogue Marine in exchange for 800 obedient subordinates. But what makes less sense is that Blackbeard assumedly agreed. And I mean, he's always been a bit of a wild card, but even for him, it is crazy that he agreed to this. He even gave the battleship back. So this is a situation where Kobe must have rolled a natural 20 for charisma or something. There is no other explanation. But this whole chapter is Kobe's condensed journey to becoming the hero. And my favorite flashback of the three was the final one because I gave Kobe far too little credit. I said in 1087 that if the worst were to happen to Garp, then Kobe would grow and mature by taking on Garp's training regime. And I apologize severely for underestimating Kobe's motivation. Because as it turns out, he's already been using the battleship bag for almost as long as we've known him. This diary of Kobe Meppo stuff, even here, he was punching battleships with a very Luffy mindset, training hard so that he could protect all of the everyone. I'd also like to note again that Kobe negotiated Blackbeard returning the battleship. And my headcanon for that is because Kobe knew that, look, if the worst were to happen to him, then someone else was going to need that battleship to punch. They're a very valuable training commodity. But I loved that Kobe recognized his weakness even back then. In fact, especially back then. He did start out having been one of the 
genetic lottery losers. One of the wimpier characters we've ever encountered to this very day. So he knew that undertaking the same training as everyone else was not enough. To make up for his starting point, which was like way, way, way back here, he needed to work, what was it, 200 times harder than everyone else. And this is where I believe that Kobe's Conqueror's Haki is seated. But we'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. I really liked the panel of the battleship. In the last chapter, the ships used by Kuzan and Garp looked so used and overpowered. Overpowered by the people who were punching them, that is. But the way this panel is drawn really puts into perspective how overwhelming a battleship is. And you can barely make out little Kobe. He's just a mere speck of silhouette. Which then transitions perfectly back into the modern day where Kobe is facing a similarly overwhelming object. Except this one is actively capable of harming him. So here's the plan. Garp creates a distraction, Helmepo protects Kobe and Gru, Gru protects ship, and Kobe needs to somehow destroy the island hand. No pressure, Kobe. Just display a shocking amount of power that you've never come close to doing before. Not a problem, and I love this teamwork. Helmepo probably gets the least of the glory, but he had a cool moment where he had to like slice the cannonball to save Kobe and Gru, and it shows that he's evolved into a genuinely reliable dude guy. It reminds me a lot of Usopp's growth, especially his line in One Piece Stampede, which is that the sniper's job is to support the captain. And here it's Helmepo's job to support Kobe. To reinforce that, it's also Helmepo that saves Kobe at the end, much like how the Straw Hats have to take care of Luffy after he does his big finishing attacks. Speaking of big attacks, Garp unleashes another ridiculous attack, Galaxy Divide, which is stunning. And you know, I'm getting sick of saying the word stunning in these reviews. I mean, there must be synonyms out there somewhere, but I can't think of any because Oda's art keeps stunning me. The best thing I can say about this moment is that somehow it doesn't undercut Kobe's moment, despite being arguably a much larger scale spectacle. It did briefly make me question whether or not Garp himself could have taken out the arm and avoided the whole being left behind thing. Probably not though, because there was a panel showing the island with multiple arms. So Pizarro had to be disarmed, so to speak, in order to give the Marines an opportunity to escape. Also, Kuzan needed to be distracted, otherwise he would have just frozen the sea. And then it happens. Kobe, for the first time, I imagine, unleashes Honesty Impact. And honestly, look, the name sounds a bit wimpy. I feel like Kobe definitely needs to workshop that a bit more. Doesn't quite have the oomph of a galaxy impact. Although I guess that honesty can sometimes feel that devastating. But again, it was a stunningly drawn attack. Much like everything I said about the battleship panel, you can barely even make out where Kobe is. That is the sheer scale of it. But just like that, the next hero of the Marines rises. We may have lost Garp, but his will lives on rather ferociously in the fists of Kobe. Also a massive revelation. As part of the punch, there is also a burst of black lightning, which indicates that Kobe is using Conqueror's Haki. Slight note here, it's not just the black lightning that indicates Conqueror's Haki. I also believe that Kobe is using Conqueror's because he didn't make physical contact with the island arm. So if anything, Kobe is using advanced Conqueror's Haki. And while it could be tempting to explain it as advanced armament, those attacks are almost always portrayed without black lightning. Like Luffy versus Kaido, for example. Black lightning was only drawn when Luffy started to channel Conqueror's Haki. So long story less long, Kobe almost certainly does have it, but there are inconsistencies elsewhere in the series that we can go over in another video. Personally, I love it. I think that nothing less than Conqueror's Haki would be acceptable to match Kobe's willpower in this moment. And narratively, it also makes sense because Kobe has long since had the goal to become a Marine Admiral. He wants to be a leader, not so much for a selfish desire to become the Pirate King, like say Luffy, but in order to protect people. And of all of the non-GARP Conqueror's Haki users, the one I'd most equate Kobe to is probably Katakuri. His goal was to become a perfect fighter to protect his family. And most people who are aiming for the top of any given field, whatever their respective reason is, tends to be a Conqueror's Haki user. It does make me rethink the idea that you need to be born with Conqueror's Haki, which I suppose was only ever said by Daisy on Amazon Lily. And characters like Treble have gone on to say that those with Conqueror's Haki are chosen by the gods. But the most reliable source of information, Silver's Rayleigh, really, has never said anything that even comes close to that. Just that most people who make a name for themselves tend to possess this power. So I think it might be awakened through willpower alone. And in the end, as much as some people may be shocked, I think Kobe having Conqueror's Haki was a fairly predictable outcome. He's the next hero of the Marines, the guy who is inheriting the will of Garp. So narratively, there's no way he couldn't have it. I will say that Garp's faith in Kobe here is really touching though, because he's smiling throughout this entire endeavor. Garp knows that Kobe is going to pull it off. In fact, he's more certain of that fact than Kobe himself. And so we're left with a very bittersweet aftermath on Hachinosu. I have such 
conflicting feeling seeing Garp defeated on the floor, surrounded by the Blackbeard pirates. And the Blackbeard pirates themselves also have very conflicting feelings, by the way. You look at their faces and none of them are happy about this situation. They caught Garp the hero, but they know that Garp the hero beat them. And they also know that there's another mini Garp out there now with more future potential. Although my favorite expression is definitely a Vala Pizarro. It's so comical how Hachinosu just looks so cartoonishly annoyed, like a At first, I couldn't figure out why this was so jarring, but it's because the Blackbeard pirates are almost always shown smiling, kind of like Doflamingo. So to see them making other facial expressions, whether it's anger, annoyance, or just uncertainty, that tells me that they know they've been beaten here today. Kuzan's expression is definitely the hardest to judge. I personally interpret it as Kuzan having to make a very tough decision by impaling his mentor, but his expression also matches the disappointment of the Blackbeard pirates. And in retrospect, without Kuzan, the Blackbeard pirates would have been decimated here. So as much as we as readers doubt Kuzan's loyalty to them, in world, I can't see any reason for the Blackbeard pirates to doubt him anymore. So regardless of whether Kuzan is with us or against us, mission accomplished. It looks like Garp is being frozen in a very Jaguar D Soul style, which might give me more cause for concern if it hadn't been revealed during this very arc that Soul is still alive. In fact, everything about this situation is very Soul. The freezing, the hopeful speech, and even the laughing. So I highly doubt that this is the end of Garp. But also, Garp doesn't know that, and so he's giving a very classic Will of D smile. Thinking about it, Kuzan's ice is the only realistic way that Garp can be restrained. I mean, what other substance could possibly control him? He's not a fruit user, so you can't even encase him in sea stone. I mean, you could, but it would be just as effective as regular stone. So what happens now? Do they try to cash him in with Cross Guild? Because that's three billion berries, mate, and with what money are we paying that three billion berries with? And so does that lead to Cross Guild making an alliance with Shanks or Luffy in order to avoid paying their debts? Because I have to say, that would be a very buggy path to alliance hood. But according to our narrator, Garp has now been declared missing. Very ominous. Much like how the narrator said that Vegapunk had gone missing on Egghead Island. And speaking of, the siege of Egghead Island has begun. The Marine Armada of 100 ships has officially arrived. And everything that's happened up until this point, Shanks versus Kid, Blackbeard versus Law, Garp versus Hachinosu, it's all been a series of starters compared to the insanity of a main course that's about to happen on Egghead Island, and I am so ready to get back into 